There's been a couple of false starts, stops and starts in Canadian lithium. Uh, companies haven't succeeded in building a big ongoing mine, but there are still plenty of would-be contenders. However, it might be a, a year or two, even several years, before we get actual mined lithium production in Canada. Maybe it's time to try and get ahead of the curve and buy into some lithium stocks. We're joined by Cole McGill, Associate VP of Mining and Metals Research at Stiefel. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me. So we're talking, obviously, about hard rock lithium mining. Yes, sir. you mean here. Yep. So we, we did a while ago talk to Namaska Lithium. They were going to do it in Quebec, but that, so far that hasn't worked out. Yes, that's the case. A lot of that has been due to the issues with impurities, um, as well as things like iron and, and mica contents. Um, those are asset-specific issues. What's interesting now is that I think we're actually at a real um, conflux in terms of where the industry is going. Right? Canada has the resources. Um, it's up to us to execute in terms of getting these to market. But in doing so, we need to find solutions that can get those um, to market in, in a time-effective, economically, or excuse me, environmentally um, effective, but also stakeholder. Um, effective way. Before we get into a couple of companies that are doing this, give us your view on the overall lithium market globally. Are we looking potentially at deficits? Yes, I think I think so, um, definitely. By the end of the decade, um, it's forecast by the IEA and a bunch of other um, international um, energy sources that we probably are going to need in excess of around 3 million tons of lithium. That compares to the market right now at around 800,000 um, tons of, of lithium. Wow. So that's 400% supply growth or production growth, right? We haven't seen that in terms of any commodity in the past 20 years. That's uh, just electric vehicles, I guess, are the story there. 100%, yeah. Where the, now, Australia has emerged as the world's biggest supplier of lithium from their mines. Yep, that's correct. Um, Australia, by the hard rock method, mostly lithium spodumene projects, as well as South America, namely Chile, and increasingly so Argentina, um, via, via brines. Um, what about the big players in lithium, though? I'm just wondering, would they be tempted to flood the market to keep the price down or modest? to uh, try to discourage new entry? The issue is because the industry is so capital intensive, it's really hard to turn on and turn off supply. There's brownfield supply coming online, namely out of a few asset expansions in um, in Australia. And we're, we're, sorry to interrupt, we're looking there at uh, the, the potential greenfield and brownfield supply. Carry on. Yeah, please. That's correct. Yeah. What's really going to cause the industry to go into a, I would say, a structural deficit is the fact by 2026, a lot of that brownfield supply will have turned on. It's the greenfield projects that are exposed to permitting risk, that are exposed to development risk and financing risk. Mm -hmm. It's really going to move the needle in terms of are we going to be in a supply deficit or supply shortage. You have some uh, potential lithium producers that are on your radar. Start off with Frontier Lithium. I think they they want to mine in Ontario. That's correct. So Frontier is mine is planning to um, develop a mine north of Deer Lake in northwest Western Ontario. Um, they have what's interesting is when I think about inflation hedges and in inflation certainty, I always think about what's high grade. Because if things are high grade, you usually need to mine less, you need to truck less, you need to delineate fewer tons to get to market and process those. Mm -hmm. Frontier has the highest grade resource um, of a hard rock uh, lithium project in North America. So it's a good inflation hedge. Um, that coupled with low impurities, I think, makes them uh, less risky in terms of some of the issues that you mentioned with Namaska, um, as well as other projects in Quebec. Um, we're having a look at a map here of some projects in uh, in Quebec and Ontario. Do these things occur on that old Canadian shield, the ancient rock? That's exactly it. And that's kind of how I preface this report in terms of Canadian geology being a Canadian shield against supply chain bifurcation, right? We have the resources on our doorstep. It's up to us to get those to market in a way that benefits all stakeholders. So there are some important advantages you identify, um, including the fact we have an auto manufacturing sector not so long ago, and governments are more than keen to get lithium battery technology uh, people investing is in this country. That's the idea, right? It's developing a vertical supply chain on the doorstep of one of the largest automotive markets in the world, in the US, right? We have the critical minerals here. We have the same type of geology. We have actually, on average, fewer impurities, um, similar types of system size, a lot of the Australian systems. Okay. We need to get those to market and feed the automotive sector. There's been, or Doug Ford, under the past 18 months or so, has announced up to $16 billion of automotive investment with Honda, with Stellantis, GM, in terms of refitting a lot of previously internal combustion engine build-outs with new EV build-outs. Um, Doug Ford, the Ontario Premier, of course. And then you have another stock on your radar, Critical Elements. What are they all about, please? Yep, that's a, uh, it's a northern Quebec um, lithium play. They're looking to develop the Rose Project, 
Um, and the beauty with this one is that it's one of the highest purity mines. So when we spoke about issues with Wabuchi, or Namaska, excuse me, and, and North American Lithium, the beauty of um, critical elements is that they have one of the lowest impurities mines, so it really protects them from processing risk. Um, what about the, the plants, though? Do you have to build a plant to produce lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide if you have a mine? Yeah, so usually spodumin goes and for lithium hard rock assets, they go and they feed, um, they feed hydroxide facilities. And that's kind of the interesting thing that we're seeing right now is that in terms of a lot of the what I call catalytic capital, which is a lot of the government sources of funding from the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense in the States, those agencies consider Canada as domestic in terms of vertically integrating supply chains. The Americans do. The Americans do. Yeah, yeah, do, yeah. Right? And mm -hmm. so technically, these Canadian companies with Canadian assets on Canadian soil are eligible for those that, that source of funding. Now that creates a bit of competitive tension in terms of the US government's potentially funding these, mm -hmm. but asking for these companies to stateside and bring the, the domestic resort or the domestic upgrading potential like hydroxide facilities on the side of the states. So that can add a bit of competitive tension mm -hmm. um, in terms of developing this and getting non-dilutive sources of capital for these projects. I should ask